Live from Emerald City in Seattle, Washington, the UFO, Bigfoot, and Paranormal Hotspot of the Pacific Northwest. Coming directly to you from listening in around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Sunday. I am your Michael W. Hall, the Paranormal Lawyer, occupying the captain's chair tonight for SOR headquarters. We welcome you all to tonight's show including all of our listeners on the digital side at Revolution Radio. And don't forget, you can always find our archive shows for free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do us all a favor and hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some bumblefoot, checking our Spaced Out Radio store, and Catching up on Captain Shirts, Fire, and so much more. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chives. Help us make that 10% happier by donating to Chive Charities. You can find them on our website. Tonight we are, of course, starting off the show with Peter Gellert from the National UFO Reporting Center and all the new UFO sighting reports that have been coming in around the world uh, since last week, but also our main guest tonight is the infamous Laird Scranton. Oh my, from Ancient Aliens and all the various television shows that you've seen him on uh, as a, uh, a social commentator, as an expert in the paranormal and uh, the idea of ancient wisdom. So we're going to have a lot of fun with Laird uh, after we have Peter on there. First of all, let's make sure we've got uh, Laird hooked up with us. Are you there, Laird? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you very much for inviting me on tonight. Uh, I've been looking forward to this all week. Oh, wonderful. I am too. This is great. I appreciate you uh, being available to us to uh, to really come on at time. Uh, not just in the news, but it's always interesting to talk with you and get your perspective on things for sure. Uh, and Peter, are you there? I'm as here as I ever am, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'll tell you what, let's, uh, since we were a little late getting started, um, uh, I don't know if you mind, uh, Laird, uh, if we go over a little bit, uh, maybe after the break at the bottom of the hour, we hold over Peter just a little bit. We'll see if that's going to work out. But let's get into Peter and allow him to do his sighting reports as usual at the uh, beginning of the show here. Well, thank you, Michael. And I, like Laird, always look forward to these programs. You're turning in, into a very skilled host. You, you've seasoned well over the recent months, and I compliment you. You're a great guy to work with. <laughs> I love that. It's a good compliment coming from Peter Davenport that I season well. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're doing a good job. Well, I've got six reports. I may be able to squeeze them in before the bottom of the hour. The first one that I'd like to share with our audience comes from North Charleston, South Carolina, an adult female, uh, wife, I believe, describes on the 6th of November, Friday, I believe that was, at 3.30 p.m., broad daylight, she writes, blue sky, she saw a very bright, what she calls a bright white square UFO. Shape was, she just said, a square, that is, Imagine a square that's been stepped on from the top and buttoned into a lateral shape, or a rectangle, rather. And the corners were rounded, and it had, she observed, a silver band in the midpoint, or just below the midpoint, that ran from left to right, I assume. It hovered silently, hanging in the air, and she turned her head away for three seconds to see whether other people behind her might be looking at the same thing. And she turned her head back. She has made she was looking away from it for approximately three seconds. She glanced back, and it had disappeared in the three seconds during which she was not looking at it. So what it was, I have no idea, but I received several other similar reports over the last six months or a year of the notable ones have to be uh, aircraft pulling advertising banners. But that doesn't appear to be one of them. She said uh, she was close to the estimates that she was able to 
determined it was neither a balloon nor a drone. What it was, I have no idea, but that is invariably the case in handling these UFO reports. People will frequently call the hotline wanting to know what they saw, and I can't tell them that. <coughs> this is one case of that nature. And, and this is, uh, it was a white object that was emitting light, or was it just a, a light colored white object? I believe it was a light colored object. I, I can't say for sure. Sometimes the descriptions are a little bit sparse yeah. relative to what I'd like to have. But it was a broad daylight sighting. She writes, broad daylight and blue sky. She estimates the object was only perhaps 200 yards away from her. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You you would notice, obviously, if it was being uh, towed by, uh, you know, an aircraft as an advertising sign, for sure. Yeah, you'd hear something. Yeah, usually that's the case. Not always, it turns out. Sometimes the banner will obscure the aircraft if it's a towed banner. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. And... Oh. and uh, it's, obviously, she she was impressed enough to be able to make this sighting report to the National UFO Reporting Center, too. Yeah. She, she wrote a very nice report. She describes the event very nicely. It makes me suspect that she's probably a very good witness. I have another report. This was the 8th of November. This passed Friday, two nights ago, two afternoons ago from Evansville, Indiana. A gentleman writes that at about 4.30 p.m. Indiana time, I think Indiana's on East Coast time, but I'm not sure. He was uh, out walking his dog, and he looked up into the night or afternoon sky. It was getting dusk, I presume. And he saw a cloud of what appeared to him <clears throat> to be what he writes is faint white mist, and it was appeared to be glowing, which attracted his attention. And he reached for his phone to take a picture, and he zoomed the phone in on it. At about the time, the cloud apparently turned into a delta-shaped craft. Oh my! Well, apparently, the craft may have been obscuring itself in a cloud of mist. Yeah. But he writes that, it, that no sound was heard. It was absolutely silent. And it was moving very slowly. But he emphasizes that he got a very good view of that Delta object, or let's call it a craft. And he has no idea what it was. Uh, he looked at it for, yeah, it's about an hour. Oh, really? Oh, my goodness. I just noticed the duration. Yeah. I realized it watched it so long, which, well, it cast some doubt on credibility, the fact that he didn't get a photograph. Yeah. He's not one he shared with the center here, but yeah. I don't know what it was. You know, and, and, and this was, again, where was it located, the sighting on this one? In Evansville, Indiana. Gosh. You know, Peter, it, it's just hard to, to think that uh, if, for instance, this might be some military craft that we are in possession of, what what are they doing hovering over Evansville, Indiana for that length of period of time in a stealthy mode? You know, what, what do you think? I mean, it's almost like begs to uh, the question of, you know, what are they using these platforms for? Very logical question, Michael. And that's one of the arguments that I usually cite when people ask me whether UFOs are anything more than just military equipment, perhaps experimental, perhaps secret, that are flying around the skies of the United States and the rest of the world. Uh, I don't think so. If they had a mechanical problem with the craft, you don't want one of your top secret craft landing in somebody's backyard or injuring or somebody or damaging property. Yeah. 
Exactly. <clears throat> Let alone the fact that if they're flying that low uh, and everybody and their brother has a telephone nowadays with a camera, um, obviously the they're not worried that people are going to take photos either. Yeah. Oh, oh fascinating stuff. Keep, keep going. I think we can get another one in at least uh, here before we have a break or two. And then we'll uh, see if we can hold you over for a few moments. Okay, sounds good. The next sighting comes from none other than Staten Island in New York City. A gentleman who describes himself as an electrician, so he's probably got good technical knowledge, describes that last night, the 14th of November, at 8 p.m. East Coast time, he was outside giving his, his last walk for the day and began to see orange globes die, or at least one orange globe. Huh? And he asserts that this orange globe suddenly split into two, and the smaller globes, or subsequent globes, I should say, continued to split, and they became 12, ultimately. And... Uh, after several minutes of hovering in the night sky, looking to be nothing more than orange globes hanging in a random formation, they uh, suddenly just winked out and disappeared. And in this case, they have a video, which I haven't seen yet. They may have sent it, but I'm getting so much material, Michael, that oftentimes I'm unable to see look at the video before a program yeah well that you know at, at first when you started to give that orange globe idea again i was thinking that this could be again those orange fireballs that you um have told us about but that's a little different than an orange fireball these globes sound like a little, little different kind of an entity or, or craft Part of the reason I share this report with our audience tonight is because you're correct. I have received so many reports like this that I'm intrigued by this type of phenomena where a light splits into two or in some cases they go the other direction. They combine multiple lights into one and it seems unlikely to me that they could be sky lanterns or so-called Chinese lanterns. They don't do that. And uh, very, I find these reports intriguing. You know, this phenomenon has been going on for, well, since May of 2012 is when it really began in earnest. The, the orange fireball uh, phenomenon is what you're saying, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you were the one who kind of broke that at the time that this seems to be a new a new thing when they started out back in 2012 all of a sudden people were seeing these glowing fireballs streaking across the night sky uh with sometimes no sound it sounds like exactly yeah our listeners would like to see some of the early reports about orange fireballs they can go to the first of june uh, 2012, a police officer from St. Louis, Missouri, was driving south with his wife and their infant child on Interstate 55. They were probably 10 miles south of St. Louis when he saw a cluster of, he estimated, as in the case from uh, Staten Island that I just cited, also, a dozen orange lights streaking in from the west and passing in front of his car. The next night, Jan June 2nd, again, 2012, and these cases are posted to the website at ufocenter.com. Uh, there was a sighting just east of Portland and Vancouver, Washington, Portland, Oregon, and Vancouver, Washington by a bunch of female hikers who were camped on the edge of the river. And they too saw a, a number of orange lights moving steadily up the river, and they then turned north and disappeared 
into the northern sky. So we're, I'm getting, I've, over the last eight years, I've gotten a lot of reports. Probably, I would estimate, Michael, in excess of uh, 10,000. Wow. Uh, orange fireball reports. Red, orange, yellow, amber, and gold fireballs, yes. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating, Larry? Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Uh, I uh, grew up in the Salem and Portland area, so I'm interested to hear about those kinds of reports. And if people want to see a bunch of reports from one saint, they can go to my website, ufocenter.com, and sort the database of cases by the state province in which they were seen and go to South Carolina and they will see a whole bunch of probably dozens or hundreds of similar sightings from principally from uh, Myrtle Beach, North Myrtle Beach, Pauley's Island and from the county of, from Harris County, H-O-R-R-Y County. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, you guys, I feel we're just getting started here with Peter. Um, do you mind, uh, Laird, if we uh, hold Peter over for uh, 15 minutes or so on the other side of the break here? Not at all. I'm, I'm easy. I'm happy to do whatever works for you. Mate. Wonderful. Uh, well, Peter, why don't we do that if we don't want, if we can uh, impose upon you for a few more moments? That'll be fine. I've got a few minutes. I've got to make a phone call at uh, originally at 9.30, I think there's a little slot in it, so... Oh, okay. Uh, well, we've got six minutes. We've got six minutes now, if, you, if that's enough time. If not, we will get you off as soon as we can after the break. Okay, I'll hang on for a few minutes. Okay, so, here, we, here we go, folks. Uh, go ahead and mute you guys' microphones on your end at this point, and I will go to our first commercial break. See you in six minutes. Hey, Space, hey, Space Out Radio, Radio fans. fans, it's, it's John, John Reza, founder, founder of the Chai and Chai, Chai series. series. Our, Our goal, goal is to make, make the life, life of veterans, veterans first responders or those with rare medical conditions, conditions and percent We do this, we do this by, by donating, donating one, one grant, grant, grant data, ranging from bands to therapy programs to prosthetic lenses, to those who need it most. To contribute to Space Out Radio's official charity, head over to ChaiCharities.org and become a donor today. I'm feeling a little, little spicy tonight. tonight. What, to what, to do? Do? what to do? What to do? What to do? Why not, Why not get Bumble, Bumble Fox? Fox? Four million Scoville units of pure, pure hard rock. rock. Bumble Foot Hot Sauce comes in three, three flavors. flavors. The Burning, the burning Bumble, 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 at spaceoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience has proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Are you addicted to the woo? Good, me too. 
This is Dave Scott, and you can woo it up with me every Monday through Friday, starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, for three hours of great entertainment in the subjects you love. UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, intuition, yes, we hit it all five days a week. Look for us at spacedoutradio.com, where together, my friends, we own the night. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. are back with Spaced Out Sunday, and uh, we've got Peter Davenport on the line, we've got uh, Laird Scranton tonight, and uh, we are in the midst of the sighting reports from Peter uh, that have come in since last week, so uh, Peter, are you back with us? I'm back with you. All right, are you there, Laird? Yep, I'm right here, listen. Nice. Okay, well, let's uh, let's do this. Uh, uh, you probably didn't have enough time to make that phone call yet, Peter, right? Oh, yeah. I called him, and they're standing by. So when okay. we're done here, I'll call him. Okay, great. Well, let's uh, not keep you too long. We'll do a few more sighting reports and let you go. But go ahead. Just a comment about your office. During the break, I was admiring your office, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got the little fireplace blazing away here in the corner. We've got... Uh, we got my leftover Halloween bling as well, and Area 51. We, we got it all. Yep. 
I marvel at how you have a lock fire in that monitor. It's just <laughs> surprising it doesn't damage it. I know, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> and I was also noting that you appear to write with your left hand. You're a left-handed writer, as far as I can tell. You got it. But you use the mouse in with your right hand. Yeah, isn't that weird? I just never... I was trained, you know, as a techie freak when everybody started out, uh, like... Uh, like the mouse was, I guess, supposedly made for the right hand. I don't know. I guess I adapted here somehow. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. I'm left-handed, but I use a mouse right-handed. Yeah, there you go, Laird. Well, you know, left-handers, uh, you know this, Peter, as well. The 10% of people on the planet who are left-handed are the most discriminated against minority in the world. That's my <laughs> pet peeve. Uh, people have no clue about that if they're not left-handed. I've heard the same story from my brother who's left-handed. Ah, and, so, and he is a medical physician, so that that's interesting, yeah. yeah. Well, well back, back to reports, I've got uh, three reports that I'd like to share. The next one, the fourth report for tonight, comes from Little Egg Harbor, New Jersey. I don't know where that is, but this is a sighting early this morning, 1.45 a.m. East Coast time, Little Egg Harbor, New Jersey. Zip code 08087, the gentleman, no, this is a young lady, writes that she saw yet another triangle story. She saw a triangle shape with three circular dim lights in each corner and a red light in the center. Her impression when she saw it, she saw it only about 15 seconds as it streaked across the night sky was that it was semi-transparent, no sound, totally silent, and it moved with an unusually smooth movement across, uh, along a straight line across the sky. She says, she goes on to write, she was out watching me the meteor shower at 145. I think that's the torrid meteor shower that takes place in November. And she and another witness, so she has a corroboration of her sighting, saw this triangular-shaped object moving too fast for an airplane, she writes, and no sound whatsoever. Triangular-shaped, almost transparent, and three dim lights in each of the corners. So, <clears throat> well, that's, that's a classic, uh, almost like a TR-3B kind of craft report that we've all heard about. Sure is. And I include it because it's so similar, or it is reminiscent of the similar report from Evans, Evansville, Indiana, that I talked about just before we broke, took their break. Yeah, right. <clears throat> Interesting. So, yep. Okay. The next one I'd like to share is also from this date, 15th of November, 2020. This one comes from Somerset, Massachusetts, and this is a doozy. Uh, 1603 hours, 403 p.m. East Coast time. A gentleman writes that he saw a single, yet again, a story about a report about an orange red orb, except this guy is an aerospace engineer. And he wow. said he, he saw an orange-red orb traversing the sky in 30 seconds. That was the duration of his sighting. And it went, it moved from the southeast to the northwest in southeastern Massachusetts, Somerset, Mass. And it covered about 100 to 110 degrees of arc. That is over approximately a third of a circle in 30 seconds which rules out any kind of satellite uh, or most other aircraft, traditional terrestrial aircraft. No zigzagging, no other lights up there, no white headlights. He goes on to emphasize that there were no red and green running lights or navigation lights on the wingtips. It had no wings. It was just a single orange-red ball of light and I'd like to cite the gentleman's credentials. He calls himself a data scientist, former Air Force officer, holds a BA in mathematics, 
from prestigious universities uh, with a magna cum laude uh, grade point. Yeah. So it's a very good signing. Wow. You know, you know, isn't this weird, uh, Laird, that you've got that kind of craft uh, in our atmosphere going that fast and there's no sonic boom at all reported? Right. That is, that is pretty interesting. You wonder what's going on. A lot, a lot of these uh, sightings, you know, sort of fly in the face of physics in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, Peter, uh, you're talking 130 degrees of an arc or whatever. <clears throat> in in that 30 second period um i mean it's got to be faster than the speed of sound which would create a, a boom somewhere you know yeah. depending on how far it was from the observer if it was order on the order of miles from the observer that's correct it would have been almost certainly it would have been supersonic and you would expect a sonic boom so yeah and if it and if it was close enough to to hear, hear a sonic boom, the thing could have been really massively large as well, <clears throat> you know, uh, depending on how large this thing was, you know. Of course, there's no hard-to-tell perspective, but, yeah, there's lots of conundrums when you're talking about these sightings that you are receiving here. Yeah, that's for sure. But yet another report of an orange or red light of unidentified nature in this in this case the night skies above the united states and we're hearing nothing absolutely nothing about it right <laughs> right no. in the press. oh it's got to be frustrating peter um and and laird peters tells us that he, he probably gets maybe only one out of every twenty thousand actual sightings reported to the National UFO Reporting Center from around the world. So lots of this stuff is going unreported. Yeah, there's an awful lot going on these days, and a lot of it more and more credible. Yeah, it sure is. Well, we might have time for one more, Peter, if uh, if you want. Uh, that would be wonderful. One more is the order of the day, because this is my sixth and last report. Thank you for that, Michael. Yeah. This one comes from Delaware City, Delaware. Uh, from this evening. The individual wrote a time of 0700 hours. I think she meant uh, 1900 hours because she alludes to dark skies. So she writes that she too saw orange flashes in the sky as in the case where I, that I just reported. She reports that it's she and another witness we're driving on a back road near Delaware City, Delaware again. And an object crossed the road at high speed, very high speed, just in front of them. She estimates the object was not more than 20 yards in front of her car as they drove through a rural area of Delaware. Then she goes on to say that about 10 seconds later, two very bright, rapid succession successive orange flashes lit up the sky, just illuminated the entire sky. No sound, but it looked like some kind of explosion. She said it looked very much like the color of lightning, except there were no bolts of lightning visible. So, wow. what it was, I have no idea. She doesn't describe its shape. She just described it as metallic and sleek. What it was, I have no idea, but one would not expect the terrestrial aircraft to be within 20 yards of an automobile. No. And, and apparently it, it was close enough that her binocular vision could estimate the distance from her location, the range. Yeah, and, and the fact that some kind of explosion or, or light, source lit up the night sky who knows if it was a crash or what that, that's interesting yeah. Yeah. oh my so well, that's my report <laughs> yeah and, 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 and let's give the contact information so people can get a hold of you uh with their current and or historic sighting reports yeah thank you uh if they have had a recent sighting <clears throat> within the last week or so they're 
Welcome to Call the Hotline, which is area code 206 for Seattle, 722-3000. That number again is 206-722-3000. And we invariably ask people to follow up their calls by submitting a detailed written report submitted via the online report form on our website set up for just that purpose. Looks like a blank job application. And the website address is ufocenter.com. And uh, if they'd like to send material through the U.S. Postal System, our postal address is the National UFO Reporting Center, or NUFORC, P.O. Box 700, and that is Davenport, Washington, like my last name, Davenport, Washington, and the zip code is 99122, 99122. And indeed, if uh, if you're inclined, folks, you've got uh, an extra five ten dollars to send Peter Davenport your way, or longer, or more. Uh, feel free to do that because Peter is a one man show out there at the National UFO Reporting Center. Has been for decades, and sure could uh, use a little bit of uh, you know monetary uh, uh, help every once in a while. So thank you again, Peter, for coming back on with uh, these top quality and very timely sighting reports tonight again. Well, thank you, Michael, as always. Thanks for the wonderful airtime on a wonderful program, and thanks to you, Laird, for uh, giving me a few extra minutes tonight. I look forward to your program. Sure, and uh, sorry to hold up your phone call tonight. Not at all. Enjoyed it. Nice to meet you. Good night. <laughs> Wonderful, Larry. Thank you very much for that opportunity to be able to uh, bring Peter on and uh, spend a little extra time with him on some of these reports. It just is amazing to me every week, the stuff that's going on right before and under our very eyes around the planet. Uh, and uh, only a few of them get reported here. But uh, I'm going to give you uh, a proper introduction, if I will. If I could, uh, and we're going to do it right now. Uh, Laird Scranton is familiar to everyone, of course, providing his expert commentary on the Ancient Aliens television series, where he has been a mainstay for a for many many years, discussing his research into the Dogon people of Africa and their astonishing astronomical insights. Laird has uh, written many books on captivating prehistoric mysteries and has recently published a book entitled Primal Wisdom uh, of the Ancients. And his uh, Scara Bray covers many of the cultural similarities between Africa and Scotland's Orkney Islands in the North Sea. For example, there is a strange similarity between the term of the kings of Egypt, the term Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh Islands. Is there a connection? We are going to have a blast tonight talking with uh, the uh, incomparable Laird Scranton. Laird, welcome aboard. Well, again, thank you very much. Uh, this, is, this is great. And I'm always happy to hear the UFO reports. You know, I, I have a, a long-time interest in that subject, as an awful lot of people do. But, uh, and there's overlap with some of the work that I do, so it's always of interest. Oh, it is. Obviously, um, the, uh, the stuff that you have done out there in the public and uh, literary-wise um, runs right across that whole idea of ancient mysteries uh, by wis uh, the wisdom keepers of uh, ancient uh, per uh, you know, peoples that seem to correspond with modern-day UFO sightings, even. Right. Um, there are also uh, connections that I haven't really written about that, um, that were significant enough that um, I made contact with. I made contact with uh, other um, figures in the UFO community, people like Whitley Strieber and, and Peter Robbins, and uh, um, I've done a lot of reading of uh, case studies by John Mack and by Bud Hopkins and, and so on. It's, so it's a topic of interest to me. Oh, wonderful. Well, we, we are, first of all, going to let people re, uh, hear a little bit about your background uh, that might not know 
uh, your uh, bio, you know, and how you got to be where you are as a as a bigwig here in the paranormal community around the world, literally. How did uh, where did Laird Scranton grow up, by the way? Well, well, I was born actually in Wallace, Idaho. Um, and sort of moved around a little bit as a child. I uh, sort of landed for elementary school years in Salem, Oregon. Uh, then for my high school years in Portland, Oregon. Um, and then ended up being one of the early male co-eds at Vassar College in the early 1970s. Um, the, the Vassar College is situated in Poughkeepsie, New York, which is not far from where I live right now. Um, I studied English there, and I also studied computer science there and ended up working as a, an independent software designer for about 200 companies around the Northeast uh, designing business software. Um, then in the late 19, 1990s, uh, thanks to my wife, Risa, I was introduced to a book uh, called Unexplained by Jerome Clark. And that book, uh, each chapter in the book um, it discusses some un, unsolved mystery in the world. And one of those mysteries had to do with an African tribe, a modern-day tribe, called the Dogen, who uh, know some things they shouldn't know about science. This is a modern-day primitive tribe. Uh, they know uh, facts about astronomy that they really shouldn't know without access to telescopes. They actually have a detailed knowledge of um, scientific concepts of creation that they shouldn't have without access to uh, equipment and, and education and so forth. Um, so I was um, studying about this tribe uh, sort of keeping notes for myself about them, and uh, eventually uh, accidentally wrote a book. <laughs> uh, my notes had been organized in such a way I realized that I could self-publish a book, and it was starting to become inexpensive to self-publish a book, and so I decided to do that. And that book ended up reaching a famous Egyptologist named John Anthony West, the, the guy who oh. uh, noticed that the, swing, the Sphinx must be older than anyone thinks because of rainwater weathering on the Sphinx. Um, there hasn't been enough rainwater in Egypt for thousands of years to produce that kind of weathering. So uh, John took my book and a manuscript for a second book to New York City and personally shopped publishers at a publishing fair and uh, arranged for my books to be published by a subsidiary of a Simon & Schuster called um, Inner Traditions in uh, located in Rochester, Vermont. Uh, since that time, I've been pu publishing a book every, uh, initially every few years, and now it's, it reaches a point where I public, normally have been publishing two a year uh, for the past three years, one traditionally published and one self-published on a range of subjects. Oh, my word. Um, the, you can't ask for a better mentor than that, pulling you out of obscurity and throwing you into the limelight. Well, that's right, and he did a lot more than that. I mean, he sort of took me by the, the hand and introduced me at conferences around the nation and uh, to uh, arrange for me to write articles for magazines and was constantly promoting my books and my work in his interviews. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away a few years back, but um, was introduced me really to the, to the larger community of researchers um, in this field of ancient mysteries. And why do you think he was fascinated with your uh, theories and with your research? Well, there are, I, I've spoken with a number of, of researchers in various fields, including uh, ranging from uh, the very scientific to the very fringe. Um, who all have had suspicions that, that um, there should be ancient connections to science. And the Dogen are sort of the gateway to that. The Dogen priests say that their symbolic tradition describes how a tribal god created matter. And I had enough background uh, to recognize that they were correctly describing an atom, and they knew about protons, electrons, and neutrons, and they could even support the descriptions with correct drawings of an electron orbital shape. Um, and so I thought, what are the chances that the descending structure that they described from there, that they go to more fundamental um, stages of matter than atoms and electrons and protons, 
what are the chances that those descending stages could also be scientifically correct? As it turns out, they all are. Um, from way, they correctly describe the stages of matter from waves to the atom and everything in between um, in such correct detail that often you could take a uh, paragraph uh, of description from the Dogen and their, their um, sand drawing and substitute it for a paragraph in a book by Stephen Hawking or Brian Greene and the diagram that goes with that paragraph and you wouldn't alter the book substantially. Um, this is uh, intuitively science. You can set it side by side with science and any thinking person should perceive a match. Isn't that fascinating? Oh my word. Um, you know what? I've got millions of questions already so this is going to be exciting but you know what we'll do i think uh is take our top of the hour break here at this point um give us a chance to reconnoiter uh, after the uh the six minutes of our uh, commercial breaks uh because i really need to get into this stuff this is fascinating and you seem to be the guy that uh, uh has got the answers here so we will be right back folks with uh with more of laird scranton after this uh, and the idea that Dogon are uh, going to teach us, uh, or at least know ahead of time what was going on before the scientists even figured it out. So we'll be right back after this. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Speak Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you. We can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at space.radio.com. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot Hot Sauce. Get your Bumblefoot Hot Sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble, f- we're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot Hot Sauce, available now at kajans.com. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Visit PurplePlates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at PurplePlates.com. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. 
the SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hi, this is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines report. We are independent, and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines Report. Hey, space travelers. This is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, and I'm bringing you the woo every Monday through Friday on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going all out to bring you the strangest, oddest stories and subjects I could find for your entertainment. Why? Because when we hit peak woo, I know I've done my job. So come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com, 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern, and together, my friends, we own the night. Welcome back to uh, our number two of Spaced Out Sunday. I am your host, the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. Thanks for joining me. We welcome back everyone listening in and our terrestrial affiliates, WQEE 99.1 FM in Noon in Georgia, and UPRN 107.7 in New Orleans. And on the digital side, we are very proud to be on Revolution Radio. And don't forget, you can always check our archives out for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and shopping at our spaced out radio store and catching up on the SOR Newswire and so much more. And we are back here with Laird Scranton. And we are just getting started into the idea of the uh, Dogon and their uh, advanced astronomical information that they seem to have known about, uh, I'm assuming for uh, eons and generations before our uh, our own scientists knew about this uh, information as well. Are you back with us, Laird? Yep, I'm right here. Yep, wouldn't go away. Oh, wonderful. Well, what I'm going to do is uh, get back here to uh, you on Zoom so we can uh, bring you on the screen. Where did I leave you? There I go. I left you there. Okay, now we're back. And you know what? I couldn't, I'm not going to let you get away with the idea 
uh, that you casually mentioned that you actually went to Vassar as a male co-ed. Now, you got to tell me that there's got to be a story there. Well, there is. So when I was in high school, I noticed that the mothers of certain friends of mine were particularly interesting women. And uh, as I got to know them a little better, I learned that each one of them had graduated from Vassar College in various years, you know, from the late 1940s um, through the late 1950s. I thought, wow, these are really interesting people. So then during my uh, junior year of uh, high school, Vassar made the choice to go co-ed, and these women organized a conference, a college conference at my high school, and I was friendly with them, so I, I had no plans to attend the conference, but I offered to help them out, offered, offered to be sort of slave labor to carry boxes in and help set up chairs and, and do, do the setup and the breakdown and so forth, but um, they ended up arm-twisting me and disdain for the conference, and I came out of that conference... Um, thinking this is the place that I wanted to go to college. Um, one of the women happened to be on the alumni board at Vassar and returned in January from a meeting there with my acceptance letter and scholarship in hand. Oh, my. A, <laughs> a, a scholarship as well. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, so um, I had uh, a choice to make. I had a brother who was at Stanford University, and I had an equivalent offer from Stanford that I had from Vassar, and so I struggled for a while trying to decide now which place should I go. My inclination was, since my brother was at Stanford, maybe I ought to go there. But I'm very, very glad that I picked Vassar College. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, it was the first uh, women's college established really in the world that was meant to be of a caliber uh, comparable to Ivy League schools for men. Yes. Uh, and uh, the sensibility that a women's college has is distinctly, ta you know, tangibly different than the sensibility that um, you find at a traditional men's school. Uh, and I learned quite a lot from, from spending four years there. Um, very appreciative. I'll give you an example of the difference in attitude. Um, at Stanford, I was told that as part of my financial aid, pa aid package, I'd be working in the dining hall. I'd have a job. And I thought, well, I can do that. I've been working in restaurants in high school. Vassar said, as part of your financial aid package, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like to work in your computer center. And they said, okay. <laughs> and that's sort of the way the relationship went for four years with them. Um, much more personable, much more friendly, much more um, focused on um, a real relationship with the student, uh, real concern about what was best for the student. And uh, I came away, uh, uh, had benefited quite a lot from having gone there. Not least to say I met my wife there. Well, I was just going to ask, I mean, what, what an opportunity to uh, literally walk around a campus that is, uh, the odds are with you on a campus like Vassar as opposed to Stanford for sure. Hey, I'd have a fighting chance there, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And by the way, what kind of uh, uh, housing did they have for you there? I mean, how did that work? <clears throat> well, this was um, co-ed co dorms uh, for the most part. Um, so um, most years, uh, you know, these are, are beautiful old brownstone buildings. Um, uh, my first year, I deliberately picked uh, um, a three-room triple because I figured if I had two roommates coming from across the country, uh, chances are I would get along with at least one of the two roommates. Uh, it seemed like I could improve my, my odds of developing a community of friends there if I did that. Um, the other years I was living mostly in single rooms, but in very friendly dorm housing. Uh, my first um, week on campus, uh, a number, a half a dozen different people sort of told me casually, oh, by the way, everybody locks their doors here. Now, I came of a period, an era, an era in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, where nobody locked their doors. And it was perfectly safe not to lock your door. So once I heard that the consensus outlook was that everybody locked their door, I thought, that's great. That means I don't have to lock mine because there's going to be nobody going around testing doors to see if they're unlocked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. And now I'm assuming... I could be wrong here, but you're talking co-ed dorm. You're talking your roommates were co-eds or? No, no, no. They had, at that point, it was co-ed uh, mostly by by um, uh, floor or, let's say, wing of floor. Yeah, yeah. 
that's kind of when I attended uh, Washington State University. They had co-ed dorm just like that as well. Uh, different floors for for different uh, different co-eds. But um, oh my, Laird, that I, I don't know if you had this experience when you were a freshman on a campus on your own for the very first time. I woke up uh, in a fraternity that I pledged uh, at Washington State University at 3 a.m. one morning, just before school was about to begin, because I was there for the pre-rush period. And um, I looked out the window of the sleeping porch where I was sleeping on a bunk bed and saw that one of my um, uh, fraternity brothers was just walking his date home at 4 a.m. out of the... Were, were there that freedom on a Vassar campus, or was this very, um, what was it like to be at Vassar? Well, uh, as I said, it's a different sensibility there. Uh, one of the differences is there's no Greek system. Yeah, yeah. Which was an interesting difference. Actually, I almost spent a semester at the University of Washington because um, my father, who had been living in Seattle, uh, passed away my freshman year of um or actually my sophomore year of, of college oh. and so i planning to spend my junior year at the university of washington and made arrangements because there were details to be settled about his estate and his will and so forth in seattle and my mother was in portland and i thought i could be a benefit by being there but in the end it got settled during the summer and i ended up back at vassar i wrote them and i said um you know, I've changed my mind. I think I'd like to come back if possible. And they said, well, we don't really have any open dorm rooms to put you in. And I said, well, um, could you uh, help me arrange off campus, an off campus apartment or room? I'd be, I, I don't care where I live. I just want to be there. And they then wrote back and uh, had managed to arrange to get me a single room in the dorm I had been living in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. The, the kind of attention, as I said, that consistently uh, happened there. But uh, no, life at Vassar was, Vassar is one of the the single most relaxed places, uh, campuses in the country. It consistently is voted happiest campus in the country in the Princeton surveys that happen every year. Um, any person I ever um, was connected with who visited the campus commented on it, what a relaxed place it was. And that was really by design. There was a, a philosophy back in the day called um, euthenics, which was... Um, uh, akin to feng shui it's an idea that the choices you make in terms of size of buildings placement of build, relative placement of buildings uh, and so forth can be used to evoke a certain uh, particular feeling or a particular sense and the feeling they were going for was a sense of well-being a sense of calmness and I'd say whoever put it together succeeded at that well wow, that is very um Progressive, obviously. I mean, especially for a, a women's university, Ivy League college like that. That's fascinating. Um, when, I, when I arrived there, um, the junior and senior classes were still all women. And these women had entered the college believing they were attending an all-women's college. And they were none too pleased to see men roaming around. <laughs> oh, reverse discrimination for sure. That, that would have been interesting. <clears throat> I had a, an abiding sense that my very presence there was undermining the things I admired about the place. Ah, good point. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, of course, um, you were interested in computers even before you got there, and they were allowing you to jump right in there, sounds like. That's right. I'd had a little bit of experience working with computers in Portland. Um, Breed College had allowed me in my high school days to to access their mainframe computer, write simple programs. And I'd worked on a, a computer at the Oregon Museum of Science and in Industry. Um, so I had a little bit of background in it, not enough to know that that's what I was interested in learning about. Um, but at Vassar, there is a, a totally different ball game. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of uh, a pioneer in the computer industry, a woman by the name of Grace Hopper. Oh, of was course. I, I mean, the, the famous Grace Hopper, yeah. Right, well, my instructor at Vassar was, had been the top student of Grace Hopper when she taught at Vassar. And so my instructor um, arranged for me to meet Grace Hopper one day when she was visiting on a campus, coming through and so forth. Grace Hopper was in the room the day that the term bug in a program was coined. 
Oh, uh, my. They, they were having, having a problem with the computer program not working, and they couldn't sort out what it was, and finally discovered an actual mock inside a vacuum tube in the computer. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Now that is fascinating. An actual moth. How the heck did a moth get inside a vacuum tube for one thing? But the idea that it was actually a bug. Oh my word. Uh, you have got to tell us, uh, Laird, a little bit about Grace Hopper and give us a little, for those who might not be up to speed on who she was, if you could give us a little info on that as well. This is historic stuff you're talking about. Sure. sure. Besides being a pioneer in the computer uh, industry, I mean, she helped develop the COBOL programming language. Um, she was also eventually the first uh, female admiral in the Navy. Um, oh, my. So she was a, a very significant person um, and uh, just larger, larger than life. But the whole mindset at Vassar College is that everybody's equal. You know, they, they encourage you, if you have a problem, find the person who's in a position to decide the issue and go to them. Don't mess around with people, the, the middlemen. Go right to the top, find the person who's in charge, explain your problem, and expect them to help fix it. And uh, so the attitude on campus was everybody's equal. It, it, it's... Um, really interesting community that way. Uh, when I was working on my first book, I um, was trying to find an, an astronomer to talk to who was familiar with African uh, star lore and star, um, uh, just their, their, their views on star um, gazing and so forth like that, their star mythology. And so I thought, how am I gonna find this person? And then I realized I had at my disposal a directory of every living person who ever went to Vassar. And in that directory was the name and contact information for a woman named Vera Rubin, who is one of the discoverers of dark matter. Oh, my. And so I, I phoned her, and she took my call. I mean, this is the way that, that uh, people from the Vassar, in the Vassar community respond to each other. And she... Um, uh, tracked down and found me the name of a very famous astronomer in South Africa, South Africa named uh, Pepe Dupe, I think is his name, who uh, was instrumental in uh, astronomy in Africa. Uh, oh my, isn't that interesting? So literally you are able to, uh, through your connections at Vassar, to be able to get to the people that you needed to get to, to get to the highest level of the information. Yeah. Yes, and I, I have, have certainly relied on that in a, in a couple of instances to, to try to solve certain research problems I've had. Um, another person that I became acquainted with through conferences is a Berkeley astronomer by the name of uh, Jeff Marcy. For years, he was head of Berkeley's search for Earth-like planets. And so the, um, years back, back in the um, oh, maybe a decade ago, I was writing a book um, about Emmanuel Velikovsky, if you know who he is. Of course. A book called The Velikovsky Heresies, and I was um, testing, 60 years after the fact, a very controversial theory he had about the formation of Venus. As it turns out, um, astronomers who study the exoplanets have now come around to a point of view that is almost indistinguishable from Velikovsky's theory, even though none of them will publicly say that. But Jeff Marcy was kind enough to sort of feed me answers under the table. I would ask a, a pointed question and he would give me the answer back that I needed for how do we know that such and such is true and uh, is it really the perspective of modern astronomers that so and such and such a thing is true, so forth. So very nice to be able to talk to, talk to the source. Uh, oh, oh, it is, uh, obviously. And the idea that, uh, that you're, you're being uh, taught directly from a, uh, a student of Grace Hopper herself at Vassar. That's fascinating to me. Um, was, was Grace Hopper involved in that uh, telemetry um, uh, thing where the submarines were figuring out how to guide missiles and things like that? Was that Grace Hopper as well? Or was she uh, famous for something else? Um. I'm not sure if she was involved uh, in that particular project. I, I know what she's primarily famous for is um, 
having succeeded with a team in figuring out how to program these computers. Because prior to um, the design of computer software languages, um, they were um, physically wiring boards to make program uh, uh, make computers accomplish tasks they wanted them to accomplish. So it was a very tedious process of of this board work, physical hardware board work, to get the computers to work. Um, the invention of a software language um, was huge because now suddenly the, all that effort became much, much more simplified. You could then evolve. I mean, she was involved in the establishment of um, uh, the ASCII and EBCD coding systems that computers work by and just setting up the structures so that um, as you work up, sort of up the scale conceptually with computers, you can have higher level commands that can make a lot of lower level stuff happen. Um, she was uh, um, heavily involved with IBM and the de development of some of those computers. Um, she certainly got the foot in the door for Vassar in terms of having IBM equipment in there um, at their, their college. Um, and, and of course, we're talking back uh, then when she was doing that, and obviously when you were doing that as well as a student. These these computers were taking up rooms full of space. I mean, these were major machines. That's right. I mean, um, uh, the size of, of uh, large filing cabinets. You know, um, each each uh, component of a computer could be as large as a large filing cabinet. Um, so I would, uh, it was back in the day when we, we would uh, write a program and key punch it into cards and feed the cards into the computer and have it um, do things. They, they're working with 256K of memory and trying to accomplish something. This is what the, like the Apollo uh, spaceships had access to, just really primitive <laughs> technology that got them to the moon and back. Yeah, yeah. And, and it isn't it fascinating, I, I believe, that a... Uh, a, a, a female, a woman, uh, would be at the, uh, the the front edge of that mathematical, you know, uh, engineering kind of, uh, you know, developing uh, system in computers where, you know, uh, people have always had that thing in the back of their men that, uh, mind that men were the only critical thinkers like that as far as, you know, computers go. And uh, she was quite a woman. No, well, quite often, especially in the in the uh, arena of NASA and uh, the American uh, space program, women have been you know instrumental in at all levels. Uh, even though they haven't been the face of the programs, they certainly have done a lot of the engineering and the technical and math work. Especially, I understand there was a famous woman of color as well in NASA. There was a mathematician, forgot her name, uh, but yeah. Right. There was a group of them. There was a film a few years back about them, about the, uh, how the success of the the space program turned on the skills of these ladies. Yeah, yeah. And that's they're called Hidden Figures. My wife Risa tells me she's my fact checker and uh, <laughs> the, the voice in my ear when I do my interviews. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Good for her. Yeah, she's keeping you on. Uh... Uh, informed as you go. That's fascinating stuff. And making making sure that I'm not just uh, spewing <laughs> garbage here, you know, nonsense. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Sounds like you have a partnership going on there with your significant other. That's uh, that's quite extraordinary. <laughs> well, she's a very talented person, you know. <laughs> what What was your wife uh, interested in when she was going to? Uh, uh, Vassar herself uh, was she in the same computer program you were in? No, she wasn't. Actually, she and I both uh, were ended up being English majors, which was an interesting uh, process. She was more into philosophy and and um, and sub subject matters like that. She had, she's multi talented. She she uh, I just we just finished self publishing a book that she edited. Her attention to detail and her ability to um, you know consider that. What I'm saying on page 123 in this book disagrees with what I had said back on page 24. You know, <laughs> yeah. that sort of skill that, skill that I don't have, attention to detail that I don't naturally have, that she is just great at. Oh, my. Well, I, I um, took enough English in university level myself to realize that to get a degree in English is very hard to do. My goodness. I mean, that's 
you're you're having to fit yourself into a mold that uh, some professors just uh, you know make you do just to make to uh, to write. And obviously, you've got your own style to deal with as well. So that good for you. I can't imagine. Well, the nice thing is, coming out of uh, with out of Vassar, a college like Vassar College with a degree in English. Uh, you know, they make you write a thesis. I think I wrote a 40-page thesis uh, as part of my degree there. Um, you come away equipped to sit down and write a book. You can, you know, I, I, I had the skills I needed to be able to self-publish a book uh, back in the day. Yeah. And without that, it would have been much harder to get to where, where I'm at right now with this. Well, and writing, um, writing at all is very intimidating, of course, to anyone. So if you've got those you know, nuts and bolts skills uh, from the best as teachers, you know, it, it, you're way ahead of most people trying to write a book, that's for sure. Well, now this really uh, ties us back into um, the Dogen mindset to a certain extent. Uh, the, the Dogen don't have a written language, and they specifically don't have one for the same reasons that Socrates was against written language. Plato tells us that Socrates felt that written language was a degradation, not progress that if you if there's any serious skill that you want to learn or a ser serious subject you want to know about Socrates had the same outlook that Master College has on it that you go to the person who's been doing this day in and day out you know for 20 or 30 years you go to an expert on the subject and you learn from them you don't learn it from piecemeal from written text you don't lose it learn it piecemeal from online articles now these days um, that the the expert in a subject is a person who knows it off the top of their head, who can explain it to you in in um, human terms, help you understand where you're wrong and where you're right about something. Much more effective way to teach things than than through writing. Well, and that is fascinating to hear that from you, uh, because um, you probably know that uh, most law schools. Uh, really get into what they call the Socratic method of teaching. Where in reality, it's not reading and writing. It's literally standing up and speaking and communicating back and forth to your professor. That's, you know, kind of the Socratic way of doing things. Yeah, very similar idea. Yeah. yeah. And that is, oh, that's interesting. I'm glad you clarified that. You know what? We're going <laughs> to... We're at the bottom of the hour now. We're going to have to take our six-minute uh, break here uh, to get back up to the top of the hour. So uh, we will do that, but we're just now going to get into the details of the Dogon, like you were mentioning. That's a great segue. So uh, thank you, Laird. We're, we're having fun. Are you enjoying yourself so far? Absolutely. Absolutely having fun. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. We're, we're, we're fun. We, we have an enjoy, enjoyable time here on this show. I'm Spaced Out Sunday, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. We will be right back, folks, with more of Spaced Out Sunday after this. Cold, Cold drinks, drinks, great, great food, food, and the and best, best music in Vancouver. Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hey, space travelers, this is John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Hello, this is yoga tall man Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. 
we're adding to the entertainment online for Space Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great form for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for something new to push your limits? Look beyond the spectrum. A new docu-series featuring some of the best researchers in the world when it comes to everything from UFOs, government cover-ups, and strange humanoids. Truth Seekers Stephen Bassett, Jeff Meldrum, Jack Kasher, and Stanton Friedman, among others, all chip in to bring their knowledge to you. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon as well as Tubi TV. Tell us what you think on our Amazon page. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month and follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do? What to do? Why not get Bumblefuck? Four million still million to pure hard rock. Bumblefuck hot sauce is coming in three flavors. The burning bumble, torn it down a bit with bumblelicious, and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble, baby. Bumblefuck hot sauce. Get it today at kajonks.com. Okay, and we are back here on Spaced Out Sunday with uh, 
with my fellow left-hander, uh, Laird Scranton, an ancient wisdom mystery expert as well. Let's see if we can uh, get back to uh, you on our feed so we can get you in there. There we go, yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, this is fascinating stuff, Laird. So you're telling us that the Dogon have no real written language that you can go back on. This is like an oral uh, society. Is it very similar to, in that regard, the Navajo who didn't have an oral uh, or a written language as well? Yes, actually, there are reasons to think that the Navajo were influenced by the same tradition as the Dogon. Um, it, it's sort of a complicated trail to, to explain it, but um, the forms that define this symbolic tradition that I'm researching and writing about um, are the same, the same ones that Jung described as being archetypes. These are the archetype themes, these are the archetype symbols, mythic storyline, mythical storylines, um, uh, ritual practices, and so forth. Uh, that. Jung was trying to explain how, how is it that these uh, inexplicably appear all over the world in cultures that are sometimes very widely distant from each other that are not thought to have had any contact with each other in ancient times. And the, um, the Dogen uh, culture is particularly helpful in trying to sort out answers to that kind of question because Dogen society enfolds... Um, aspects of at least three major ancient traditions. They have um, um, they have societal practices that are, are predictably like those of ancient Egypt at around 3000 BC. They have um, uh, ritual practices that are like ancient Judaism and they have a symbolic system that's like ancient Buddhism. And that circumstance is um, an interesting and unique one, a very helpful one, because it implies that those three traditions must have had some common source um, that influencing them in ancient times. That the most reasonable way that those three um, sets of references come together under one umbrella, one societal umbrella, is if they all started out as one thing. Uh, the Dogen um, uh, creation concepts are given using uh, ancient Egyptian words. There's a high correlation between uh, Dogen cosmological terms and ancient Egyptian words. Um, so there are lots of different ways to sort of cross-reference this. The Dogen and the Buddhists um, each represent that this symbolic system was a, an instructed tradition in ancient times, that it was deliberately instructed to many different um, regional tribal groups across the planet. And my point of view on, on Jung's question of how, how do these groups all get influenced by the same tradition, I subscribe to the Dogen and the Buddhist point of view, which is that someone who is highly capable, someone who is capable enough to be talking about correct concepts of science back in ancient times, was had, had arranged a civilizing plan and a symbolic system that they were deliberately imparting to cultures all around the planet. And that's sort of the starting point for, for the work that I do. My work is, is comparative work. Um, I try to learn more about myths and symbols and rituals and practices, ancient practices, by comparing how various ancient groups understood the same elements. Uh, yeah, and obviously um, that is, is heavily researched. You know, the whole idea that you have to literally get into... Uh, for instance, the, the history of, uh, you know, ancient Egypt as well as the ancient Dogon and uh, the Middle East and Eastern uh, societies as well. To even compare them, you've got to get in there and do all of that. That's uh, very interesting. Well, the, uh, the more you be, uh, are able to acquire an overview of what's going on with these traditions, you realize that in the original mindset of this instructed tradition, that there was nothing that was being hidden. Everything was right out in the open. That if you can get to the original meaning of an ancient term in any of these societies, the word flatly tells you what was intended to be represented. And it's even more specific than that using 
uh, symbolic languages like the Egyptian hieroglyphic language, that in the Egyptian hieroglyphic language, uh, the traditional view is that every character represented a phonetic value the same way letters in, in the English language do. But we immediately start to have a sense that that might not be true because there are only about 40 phonetic values that are typically represented in a written language. But the Egyptians have 4,000 glyphs. So clearly there was something going on beyond simple phonetics there. The question is, what was that? Well, with um, perfect hindsight, if I could have known then, in the beginning, what I know now, in trying to sort out Egyptian hieroglyphic language, I would have um, begun my focus on the very simplest words. Uh, there's a, in particular, there's an ancient Egyptian word for the concept of a week, like a week of um, a week of days. Um, the Egyptian word is written with two glyphs. The first glyph is a circle with a dot in the center of it. That's the Egyptian sun glyph, and it can represent the concept of the day. And the second glyph is an upside down, it looks like an upside down U in English. And that's the Egyptian number 10. And I thought when I saw that word, um, symbolically that says to me 10 days. And so I went and I did some research and I discovered the ancient Egyptians had a 10 day week. What do you know? The form of the word telegraphed its own meaning to me before I even knew that there was a 10 day week in Egypt. It communicated correct knowledge to me without my even knowing anything else about Egypt. Yeah. And then I later discovered that the ancient Chinese word for week was written with two glyphs. Their sun glyph, which was originally a circle with a dot, and their number 10, and they also observed a 10 day week. So we have fundamental comparability, sort of eye to eye comparability between these um, hieroglyphic languages back in the in their original forms if we if we can uh, have enough persistence to pursue it you know I have never never heard that comparison be made between um, Chinese culture and Egyptian culture and it goes right back to your theory that there is one overarching teaching mechanism that is doing the same teaching around the planet to various societies in the whole idea of a 10 10 day week now how you know obviously that makes a lot of sense i mean the uh the 10 in mathematics as opposed to our 60 or you know whatever uh how we uh do the things in uh 360 degrees and circles and those kind of thing um I wonder why that was messed with later on. Do you have any idea? Well, like, uh, the place to start answering that question is with understanding why it looks like that system was set up in the first place. Yeah. Now, if I were um, working with a culture and wanted to establish a system of measures for that culture, the sensible way to go about it is to begin with either the smallest measurable increment and base all of the, the, the upward increments of measure on that smallest measurable size, or to start with the largest measurable unit and work your way down. So virtually all of the, the measures of time that occur in these ancient cultures, in the classic ancient cultures, are even factors of what's called the grand processional cycle. The processional cycle is um, its the largest cycle that humanity can perceive. It, it, we can imagine it as being the slow, what looks like the slow rotation of constellations around the Earth. If we were to get up every morning to see the sunrise, and just before the sun came up, made note of which constellation the sun was rising in front of, over the course of 70 years, we would notice that the sun's position had moved one degree in relation to that constellation. It's a very slow rotation through these constellations. Um, that cycle is traditionally um, represented as uh, consisting of 25,920 years. Um, 
all of these other units of major, the, the, the unit 60 base major, the 12 base major, the 10 base major, the 30 day major, this, uh, um, all of these traditional units of major are even factors of that cycle, the 360 day year major. Um, so from my point of view, that's what was being, one of the things that was being represented in terms of ancient units of measure was um, representing everything in terms of that grand cycle. And isn't that, um, isn't the term the sidereal day, sidereal year, um, isn't that referring to that slow rotation of the, um, the zodiac as well? Um, yes, it's connected to the same set of concepts. Um, and depending on the source that you refer to, the ancient source or the modern source, you can hear different numbers um, tossed out in terms of how long this processional cycle um, it takes for the processional cycle to happen and so forth. But um, the one that is consistently represented by the sources that I respect most is the 25920 figure. Now, there are other units of measure that are also based on uh, um, scientific concepts. Um, I guess that some of that may be a little bit complicated to try to get into. But the, the point, the, the broader point here is that there is intelligence behind the way this system of symbols is put together. There is sense and meaning behind it. And every time you understand how to frame part of that, you're sort of revealing the hand of a group of teachers who we can see had to have been incredibly capable. They knew things about processes that um, that we don't even fully understand ourselves. It goes down not just, they're not just describing um, concepts that relate to matter from waves to the atom. They're also talking about root dynamics of energy that go deeper than that. Um, in the ancient mindset, when they're talking about creation, they're referring to three creative themes. They're talking about how the universe forms, how matter forms, and how biological reproduction happens. And for the Dogen, those three processes are parallel processes. They're so parallel to each other that the Dogen simultaneously describe all three themes using a single progression of symbols. That's what this, this union based uh, symbolic system represents. Every symbol in that system carries meaning for each of those three themes. That's, that's partly why they're so hard to understand, because you can't ask, what does the symbol of a hemisphere mean? You have to ask, what does it mean if we're talking about biological reproduction? Well, a hemisphere, in, in terms of biological reproduction, represents the concept of the expanded womb of a mother. If we're talking about the concept of the formation of matter, it refers to the expansion of mass uh, just before um, primor uh, fundamental particles form. Um, every symbol of this tradition, that's true about, that, that they have a comparable, if not precisely, not exactly the same meaning, uh, that holds a, the same relative position in the progression, whether we're talking about formation of the universe, formation of mass, or biological reproduction. So this is an intensely intelligent system. Someone with a huge amount of knowledge um, had to have put it together. And obviously then, uh, the Dogon as a society uh, had to be uh, sufficiently um, intelligent enough to understand that. Uh, at the same time, I mean, that is remarkable to think that uh, these teachers, whoever they are, were, um, were literally uh, doing this in various places around the planet. And probably um, only those societies that were smart enough to understand this brought it into their system and kept it going. I mean, obviously, that's quite an impressive thing. Right. Now, the Dogen have a societal, societal imperative to preserve original forms of this tradition. They preserve what I consider to be original syllables of spoken language, and the syllables of that language work like symbols, that each, each root syllable 
relates to a concept, and words are formed by mixing and matching these syllables together. You can you can start with the root concepts and sort of building block, put together a more complicated concept. And you know from the outset, when you hear a, a Dogen word spoken, you can tell by its phonetics what the intended meaning was. And those same phonetics apply to Polynesian language in New Zealand with the Maori tribe, which are much more modern day, a much uh, closer to modern day tribe. They're, they date from around 1680. The Dogen system I'm talking about dates from around 3000 BC. So, but the Maori tradition, even from the outset, I realized I could predict what the meaning of a Maori word was based on its phonetics. Um, and this is true for if you can get to the original name of any ancient site. The name of the site tells you something about the intended purpose of that site. Um, if you can get to the original name of an ancient tribe, it tells you what aspect of this um, creational tradition that tribe specialized in, uh, almost like a, a college um, major, that each tribe named itself for a specialty. And, um, uh, I'll give you the, the generic form of this naming convention. Um, it rests on a word, an Egyptian word called Sakai, that's pronounced Sakai. Sakai means to celebrate a festival. The Dogen have a 50-year a celebration of the stars of Sirius that they call the Sigi Festival. And Sigi, it, to my way of thinking, is the Egyptian word Sakai. In ancient Tibet and China, from the borderland of Tibet and China, there was an ancient tribe uh, originally black Africans who were called the Naki or the Naksi and that um, word, that name, the second half of that name, that, that X-I or K-H-I is the equivalent of this word Sakai. Na is a term that refers to the non-material feminine um, concept. So the, uh, the name of the tribe says celebrates the non-material feminine, the mother goddess essentially. In ancient Egypt, the term was Mira, that means loves Ra. In Judaism, it was Yahuda. Yahuda means um, celebrates, uh, the, the praises Yah. And this naming convention plays itself out all over the world. Um, on Orkney Island, uh, the, the first farming village that I write about is called Scarabre, and it overlooks um, a bay called the Bay of Scale. A scale is again Sakai L, and L is a Canaanite god of space, uh, counterpart to Yah in the Canaanite tradition. Yah is the god of light. Um, so once you understand how these naming conventions work and how the language works, you have much better visibility on what the intentions were of whoever was um, present in that particular era. The Egyptian words are, are even more useful because every ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic word flatly explains its own meaning to us. And there are certain words that actually are there to define, to assign meanings to certain glyphs. Uh, there's a, a trailing glyph that follows certain words that is unpronounced. And those words um, I see as defining words, that this is how the meaning gets assigned to those glyphs. Once you understand that, you can lay out a long list of hundreds of ancient Egyptian glyphs and what they meant, meant based on the authority of the Egyptian hieroglyphic language itself, not based on guesswork or, or inference by some scholar. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. You have to be a ling linguist, obviously, uh, to understand all of this stuff. Uh, one of my questions would be to you, uh, do you know anything about uh, the Basque language? Uh, and, and, and how that compares with any kind of uh, comparisons that you've made? Um, actually, I know a little bit, of, I've done a little bit of research about it because I have a, a friend who's a, um, an Argentinian filmmaker. And um, he uh, has um, filmed in Dogen country uh, many, on many different occasions. He's won African Film Festival Awards for films he's made and so forth. And, but his heritage is Basque, and he asked me to look into whether I thought there were obvious connections between Basque culture and Basque language and the tradition I'm studying. And uh, the response I had to give him was that 
I don't see obvious um, outward connections between the two, even though I know they had, they had similar influences. It's not reflected in in obvious ways in the Basque language, probably more obviously in Basque mythology. That's that's fast. And the only reason I ask is I was married to a lovely Basque woman for 30 years and I know a little bit about the culture. And, of course, there's always that thing in ufology that, uh, you know, Basque people have the the unique blood uh, and uh, the unique language that supposedly doesn't uh, come from a root of another language. So they want, they always wondered if it was an extraterrestrial, you know, influence out there in the Pyrenees Mountains. Uh-huh. Well, now the question of origins of the Dogen teachers uh, is an interesting one because um, this takes us into a domain where uh, traditional academics can't follow. Um, there is no answer. Okay, if, we, if we're postulating that someone in ancient times was teaching science to ancient cultures, high science to ancient cultures, there is no candidate teacher, candidate group of teachers that we can suggest that's going to be acceptable to a traditional academic. There's no way to answer that question for them in a way they're going to subscribe to. Now, I'm fortunate in that I have two different cultures who each did equivalently good jobs of preserving this ancient instruction. Uh, and they did it in markedly different languages, so we know one didn't just get it from the other one wholesale. One is the Dogen who express most of these concepts using ancient Egyptian words. The other is the Buddhist tradition, which expresses the concept mostly in Sanskrit, which is most often very different from the Dogen language. Now, the two symbolic systems are so closely matched that modern authorities on Dogen symbolism and modern authorities on Buddhist symbolism are are in predictive agreement about the meanings of symbols and meanings of rituals and so forth. Um, they, the Buddhists say that their most sacred symbols were, quote, gifted to humanity from a non-human source, unquote. That's uh, a statement that's made in the first three pages of uh, a book by a leading authority on Buddhist symbolism. The authority is named Adrian Snodgrass from the University of West Sydney in Australia. And the book is called The Symbolism of the Stupa. The Stupa is a kind of shrine. Um, the Dogen agree with that, except the, go, the Dogen go another, uh, take it a step further. The Dogen say that their teachers were not only non-human, they were originally non-material. Wow. Which is not, okay, now that's not to say that during those same eras there, there might not have also been traditional sci-fi alien type uh, interaction with humanity. It looks to me like there was. But this instructional tradition ties to a group that the Dogen say were originally non-material. Now, the, the problem in that comparative viewpoint creates for someone like me is it leaves me with only two perspectives I can take on it. The first one would be to say, well, I can see that these cultures each managed to preserve all the intimate details of the symbolic tradition, but it got down to that last detail of who they got it from, and they both somehow misremembered in matching ways who that was. That, that doesn't strike me as a very credible stance. The other approach I can take is to say that they correctly remembered that last detail, and now that means that I've got to allow the possibility of a non-human teacher. Yeah. And so my, my job then becomes to try to find a credible scientific perspective from which that might have been possible. And actually there is a path to understanding how that might have been possible. It's just a very complicated um, justification for the path. Wow. Well, Laird, uh, we're at the uh, top of the hour again. Uh, literally have to take a break here at this point, and it's up to you whether uh, we're going to try to get you to do anything further. I know you don't want to uh, overtax yourself here, and I don't want to do that as well, but what do you th what do you think? Uh, do, you, uh, 
You want to? No, I'm, I'm okay to. I'm okay to continue on here with you for for another hour. That's fine. Oh, wonderful! That is just uh, so magnanimous of you. I appreciate that. And because I tell you what, I sure would not like to leave our audience hanging like we just did right now. <laughs> this is a great segue into the commercial. We'll be right back then, folks, with more of Spaced Out Sunday. After this, with Laird Scranton. Be right back. Hey, space, space travelers. travelers. This, this is John, John Bradley, founder, founder of the Chive and Chive Chickens. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines report. We are independent and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines Report. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, and I'm bringing you the woo every Monday through Friday on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going all out to bring you the strangest, oddest stories and subjects I could find for your entertainment. Why? Because when we hit peak woo, I know I've done my job. So come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com, 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern, and together, my friends, we own the night. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get your Bumblefoot hot sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble. F- We're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot hot sauce, available now at kajans.com. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! We all know on Spaced Out Radio, we love a good beard and mustache. So why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. 
Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Hi, this is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just five bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacey Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio, where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern, where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights, right here at spacedoutradio.com. Welcome back to the third and final hour of Spaced Out Sunday. I am your host, Michael W. Hall. Thanks for being with us tonight. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates, WQE 99.1 FM in Newton, Georgia, and UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans. On the digital side, we are also on Revolution Radio. And don't forget, you can always check out our archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do us a favor and hit that subscribe button. And our website, of course, is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some Bumblefoot, shopping at our Spaced Out Radio store, and catching up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and so much more. And we are uh, just uh, pleased as punch to be able to have... Uh, Laird Scranton uh, with us for the final hour here of Spaced Out Sunday and get into now I think probably it'd be appropriate to get into some more details of uh, the Dogon uh, and the whole idea that they literally are telling us that they were being taught by not only uh, extraterrestrials it sounds like but interdimensionals is that kind of what they're talking about Laird? Um Yes, more, yes, that's one, one way of looking at it. Um, the the system here rests on a philosophy that was first expressed very early on in India. It's called Samkhya, and Samkhya is a companion to yoga. We're all familiar with yoga. Um, the principles are personalized with yoga, but all of the concepts are the same. It's the same terms used to represent similar things cosmologically in Samkhya. Samka's viewpoint is that universes form in pairs, one non-material and one material. That the non-material universe has perfect knowledge, but an inability to act. And the material universe has imperfect knowledge with full ability to act. And consequently, there are routine efforts made to communicate knowledge or to induce action, you know, by the non-material side, to induce action on the material side or to communicate knowledge, communicate knowledge to the material side. And those attempts take the form of um, meaningful synchronicities, ah. uh, very, very vivid dreams, uh, the unusual behavior of animals, uh, divination, clairvoyance, um, you know, telepathy, and all, all the other paranormal sort of effects that we experience. 
it's quite possible that what, what we experience as UFO contact has that same dimensionality to it. So the- now, okay, now Samkhya says that there's a cycle of energy between the two universes that is as essential to life in the universes as the natural water cycle is to life on Earth. The natural water cycle is, you know, the, the pattern by which water evaporates from the oceans to create clouds. The clouds rise up over the mountains and produce rain, and the rain flows back to the sea. Without that cycle of water, there'd be no life on the planet. Well, the, the Dogen and Samkhya are saying that without that cycle of energy between the universes, there would be no life in the universe. Now that now that makes okay, that makes a whole lot of sense when you're talking about uh, the various cultures around the planet that uh, put very little um, importance on the written language, written word. I mean, it, it was more give and take. Right now, the esoteric tradition in Dogen culture involves an, an initiate, a student, and an informant. A master or, or, a, or a, an expert, uh, typically a Dogen priest. The way the dynamic works is the student formulates a question to ask the expert, and if it's appropriate to what the student already knows, or the expert knows the student already knows, if it's appropriate to his educated, his initiated status, the expert is required to give him an honest answer, a truthful answer. If it's inappropriate to his initiated status, the um, priest is allowed to, uh, is required to remain silent or if necessary is allowed to lie in order to protect the inner secrets of the tradition. Any person, Dogen or non-Dogen, male or female, who is interested in learning the inner secrets of the tradition can learn them by that process. But it's driven by the student now that dynamic is the same dynamic that Samkhya says by which knowledge is communicated non-materially to the materiality, according to Samkhya. I mean, I know um, psychic healers who receive information by posing a question that they then receive an answer to in, in a, a non-physical way. It's the same dynamic. Um, that mode of communication rests on symbolism. Basically, any mode of communication that doesn't involve a spoken word is symbolic. So part of what the esoteric tradition is doing is it's training a group of initiates in this mode of communication with non-materiality. It's the mode they're going to need to communicate with non-materiality. Right. Um, isn't that fascinating? Oh, my word. And you know what? Um, every once in a while, I, I hear, I see uh, dots being connected in what I'm seeing as well, because I remember at one point there was an experiment that was done by the U.S. Army where um, literally, you know, the code talkers from the Navajo were being recruited, you know, because of the language issue, but they also were being recruited, Native Americans, because of their ability to be good trackers uh, in the wilderness and in, uh, you know, the battlefield, uh, literally, to uh, be able to find enemy uh, installations and those kinds of things. They were just very good at that. But when they found out uh, that when they recruited these guys out of the uh, reservations, the first thing they did, of course, was cut their hair, you know, for military, you know, service. And they seemed to impact their abilities uh, to use whatever they used, you know, intuitiveness uh, to track uh, the enemy. And I'm just wondering, does that kind of go into the same thing that you're talking about? The idea that nonverbal communication uh, is something that... Uh, you you uh, are able to develop and learn uh, through your own uh, your own body and how it interacts with your environment even. Um, 
Yes, I don't relate it specifically to hair, although I'll certainly look for references that might suggest some connection to that concept that cutting a person's hair might somehow impact their ability to to be receptive to these things. Um, in my field of study, the first thing a researcher learns is that there are things going on that we can't explain, can't immediately explain. Um, some of those things are very objective and very overt, you know, that other people witness them. It's not a question of your imagination there. It's a real world event that happens that's just very difficult to explain. I'll give you an example of that. Early in my process, I was following Robert Temple's um, bibliography in his book, The Serious Mystery, which is about the Dogen, um, trying to sort out which sources I needed to refer to to learn more about this stuff. And I reached a point where I realized there was a book I needed. This is in the, the late 1990s. Um, the book is called Ancient Near Eastern Texts Relating to the Old Testament. This is essentially reprinted the contents of every ancient Egyptian papyrus, many and other, other ancient Egyptian texts from other cultures like the Sumerians and... Um, groups like that, Babylonians, and so forth. Well, this was before you could go online and search for out-of-print books. And so I had exhausted every local source I had for used books. There was no new, new bookstore that was selling a copy of this book. It's a big 700-page volume. Um, none of the used bookstores had it. I had checked sort of in... in uh, concentric circles out from where I live in Albany, New York, trying to find any place that could get it for me, and they couldn't get it. I even went to the Vassar College Library to their interlibrary loan service and asked if they could acquire it from another school that I could use it temporarily just to look at it. And they couldn't get it for me. And so I finally had to concede. I, one day I went, came home to my wife where he said, and I said, well, it looks like I'm not going to be able to get that book I need. So then... A couple of weeks went by, and one day a box turned up on the back doorstep of our house. Uh, Risa had an Asian cousin who was living in a, an apartment in Queens, New York, with limited space. And every so often, he would sort of reach critical mass in his living space and decide he had to divest of stuff. And he would toss a bunch of random crap into a box. You know, Risa says, you know, flags of the nations and oven mitts and um, you name it, just all sorts of weird things. You never knew which relative he was going to ship it off to or what was going to be in the box. But this was one of those boxes, and in that box was my book. Oh, my word. Oh, <laughs> yeah. now, I love that stuff. That, that's, that's like cosmic synchronicity. <laughs> yes, it's at that point that I had to begin to admit to myself that there could be things going on I didn't understand. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I don't know how many, not that dramatic, that is very dramatic, but I don't know how many times I've run across those kinds of things. And you know what, uh, Laird, I don't know if you feel this as well. It's almost as if your psyche, your mind, um, doesn't really recognize how significant those synchronicities are at the time. It might take a few moments for it to sink into you. It does for right. me all of a sudden. I'm just going, I, I sometimes I'll, I'll pick it up off the floor or whatever that I'm looking for or wanted or something. And, and just a second later, I'm going, oh, my word, what the heck just happened? Right. And the, the more it happens, the quicker you are to recognize it, or a lot of people are. But um, simply by allowing that um, a synchronicity might be meaningful, and there are such things as just everyday coincidences, meaning, meaningful synchronicities tend to come with self-confirmation. They occur in more than one instance. That if I notice an odd reference turning up in two or three different contexts in a shorter amount of time, I suspect that I've got a meaningful synchronicity. Simply by noticing those, paying attention to those, allowing that there might be something to them, you foster them to yourself. And uh, again, the metaphor that I use to try to explain that is, imagine that you're from Eastern Europe and you attend a party uh, one night 
and um, midway through the party, you realize there's one guy sitting over the corner who speaks a little Ukrainian, and you can under have a prayer of understanding what he says. Chances are you're going to spend the whole rest of the night trying to get that guy's attention and trying to communicate with that guy. Well, that's what happens with non-materiality. When a person starts paying attention to these modes of communication, paying attention to their vivid, uh, the images in their vivid dreams, paying attention to these uh, everyday coincidences, coincidences and so on, is that you start to, to foster it to yourself and it happens more and more frequently and more and more quickly. Um, I had situations happen this week and look for all the world like non-materiality prodding me to, move, to write the next book. It's like references that are at the heart of the next book I plan to write turning up in the dreams of a person I communicate with daily. Oh my. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my word. Um, and I don't know if you've noticed this as well, but I've, I've gotten to the point in my life where, um, you know, I, I used to be a, a very good worrier. Uh, I, I was good at it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now that I have realized that um, if I let go of that worry, uh, you know, it, it helps, of course. But also that I try to express my gratefulness more often now. Uh, and when I do that, it seems to me these synchronicities, these opportunities come to my, my way better or faster. I don't know if that has something to do with it either, the idea of expressing gratefulness somehow. Well, it, help, it helps to appreciate um, the things you have, the things that a person has, or the good things in a person's life. Um, appreciating the good things sort of orients you in a particular mindset. And it could be that that mindset helps um, helps open doors of communication. It, um, is there something in the Dogon um, tradition that's similar to that as far as trying to foster communications with the, the non-material? Um, yes, because the Dogon tradition rests, as far as I'm concerned, on Samkhya, and Samkhya uh, expressly says that. It expressly defines the ways in which these these routine attempts are are being made on a daily basis to try to communicate and try to um, induce actions. But this is what I see as the root of the sim of symbolic communication as being sort of the root mo the root mode of of knowledge and of, of consciousness of intelligence. Um, Part of what my book, Primal Wisdom of the Ancients, is about is spelling out the techniques that we can see illustrated in the symbolic tradition of how that knowledge is framed. It uh, was framed by this group of teachers to try to make it more understandable and make it more easier for someone to remember, to make it recognizable to a, a future audience. Imagine back in that 9000 BC, trying to teach science to a group of what should have been hunter gatherers, we believe were hunter gatherers. But all the images are scientific images, all the references are scientific concepts. This is, and not just uh, casual science, but very co hardcore root concepts. That clearly, that information had to have been targeted at a future audience that was technological enough to recognize a shape, to recognize the shape of a, an electron orbit, or um, Buddhism begins with a set of symbols called adequate symbols. Adequate symbols are defined as symbols that, whose meaning inhere, whose meanings inhere in their shapes, that the meaning can't be lost, ultimately, even if the chain of initiates down through the generations forget what, it, what the shape means, the meaning can't ultimately be lost because it represents a shape in nature that with the proper technology you can see and understand what it means and the symbolism um, is what that shape represents it, it corresponds to what that's the scientific meaning of that shape is so that core set of symbols is the, is the, the sort of the root mode of communicating things um, 
the the Dovin do have a sense that um, l- a long period of practicing this mode of communication um, uh, makes a person proficient at it, um, and that's why it's the mode of communication between the student and the teacher that over a 20 year span of time, which is a typical amount of time it takes a, a student to get, to get on top of the core material here, that that entire time the mode of, of communication is the same mode that is going to be used non-materially to materiality. And uh, so they become proficient at it, they, they become adept at it. Is, is this something, this kind of system of teaching uh, something th- that the Dogon w- thought was important for all of the members of the tribe, or being a hunter-gatherer society, did they have a-, a caste system where there's a few people that are, you know, ability have the ability to be taught this, uh, while the rest of them go out and support the 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 group, you know, with their hard work and and gather food and those kinds of things. It, it was what kind of a system of teaching did they have? Well, the, the perspective is flipped for that. The starting point is that anyone who is sincerely interested can learn it if they want. But they, they have to have a sincere interest in it enough to continue to pursue it. To They have to have enough um, facility for it to be able to continue to frame the next pertinent question to extend their own set of knowledge. Um, so... At root, it's open to anyone who wants to learn it, Dogen or non-Dogen. In practice, there's only a percentage of any group that is going to actually pursue that and actually going to pursue it to its extreme end. And those people become, they end up fulfilling the role of priest or fulfilling the role of, of, of shaman or whatever. They're the people who are on top of this knowledge, not because of any intentional system of class casting or whatever, but just because the ones who are good at it do it. And the same is true with every other skill or function in society. The people who are good at a thing are the ones who end up doing it. They're the ones you want to have end up ending up doing it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a fascinating system. I, I think that's great. Um, Laird, we're at the bottom of the hour. We have to take a break for another six minutes okay. so you get to rela- relax, and then we're just finishing up here on the other side of the hour. So thank you for this. This is awesome, folks. We're going to be right back here with more of uh, Spaced Out Sunday after this. If you just hang in there with us, we're right back. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday, Saturday. Right, right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacey Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, night. Stacey and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays, starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning Bumblefoot. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spicing up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com.
You wanted new SOR gear and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Are you addicted to the woo? Good. Me too. This is Dave Scott, and you can woo it up with me every Monday through Friday, starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, for three hours of great entertainment in the subjects you love. UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, intuition, yes, we hit it all five days a week. Look for us at spacedoutradio.com, where together, my friends, we own the night. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. Hey Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, there. don't forget forget to check check out our our free archives archives and leave leave a comment. comment. See See you there. And we are back with Laird Scranton uh, for the last five segment of Spaced Out Sunday. Um, gosh, you know, Laird, uh, during the break, it just got me thinking. The whole idea of uh, some advanced civilization or teaching mechanism coming to a small hunter-gatherer society and trying to teach them these highly sophisticated issues, you know, of uh, the cosmos, you know, and uh, 
also the scientific issues of you know the makeup of the atom and all that why do you suppose um they were even interested in teaching a hunter-gatherer society that these kinds of concepts do you have any idea actually i do it, it's complicated if you're willing to hear it <laughs> oh i would love to i think we can just dissect it for our our listeners if if we can take it slow just go ahead we've got you know some time here but i would it just it made me think you know okay the mindset is universes form in pairs and there's a cycle of energy between the universes that is perpetual the the um the action is basically an oscillation like a dipole in and out in and out in and out <clears throat> But what's scrolling between the universes is, is not just energy, it's also mass. Now Einstein says that if you make a body more massive, you also slow down its time frame. And in other words, events occur more slowly for a more massive body than for a less massive body. So if we're progressively over the course of thousands of years, scrolling energy and mass from one universe to the other universe, the effect is sort of like sand in an hourglass. You begin with all the sand in the top globe and you filter it down into the bottom globe. The essential thing you're doing is you're speeding up time in the non-material frame and you're slowing it down in the material frame. If you speed it up enough, in the non-material frame, it looks like unity to non-materiality or to materiality. Wow. Okay, now, now, there are consequences to that cycle. The cycle is the equivalent of what in Buddhism or, or Hinduism they refer to as the yuga cycle. This is a cycle that is said, one of the effects of the cycle is it supposedly distances humanity from ability to perceive things non-material. There are certain eras in which humanity is very perceptive of things non-material, and other eras where it's completely non-perceptive of them. Okay, as you shift these time frames, when you get to the extremes of the cycle, when you have one side fully material and the other side fully non-material, Time is running so quickly, quickly on the non-material side that there is no moment in which to take action. No coherent moment. All events essentially happen at once. Perfect consciousness, no ability to act. Now, there's an equivalent state for a human being. It's called locked-in syndrome. It's a situation where the person is no longer able to move their body, but they're still perfectly conscious inside their brain. There was a famous case of this, a gentleman in France who <clears throat> suffered a stroke at the wheel of a car, and they took him home to care for him. They thought he was brain dead. He was only able to twitch his eyes occasionally. Well, one of his caretakers realized that there was a pattern to the twitching of his eyes. She, it occurred to her that he might still be conscious in there. And so she set up a system with him. She would step through the letters of the alphabet and ask him to blink at a particular letter and let him spell out a word to her. And he ended up writing an entire book called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Uh, it was also later made into a movie uh, describing what the situation was like. It, it's a horrific situation unless someone knows you're in there. It's like being buried alive, unless you have a compatriot who knows that you're there, who can act on your behalf, who can communicate with you, who can understand, be a companion for you, essentially, a companion and a caretaker. So with these universes, whose dynamic is very much like consciousness, about a third of the way into the cycle, which is called the ascending cycle, when the universe is becoming less massive, the non, that, that non-material side figures out what the trend is and that where it leads is to locked-in syndrome for that universe. It knows it's going to need a compatriot, but the only possible potential compatriot is material, the material universe. 
The problem is, the way the U.S. cycle works, is at the point where non-materiality is in that state, the material universe is most distanced from any knowledge or ability to perceive non-materiality. So the only companion it has as a potential companion doesn't know it's there at the point it needs it. Oh, my word. So, so about a third of the way into this cycle, the non-material domain decides to take action on behalf of both universes. What it does is it takes steps to establish a framework for society on the material side that has the potential to retain the memory in him for humanity of the fact that the non-material side is there so that when we're at the point we're at right now, when non-materiality is locked in, there's a group of us, a sincere group of caretakers, who understand that it's there, who know how to communicate with it, and who can take action for it. Now, now that makes sense to me. The, I, me the idea that a, uh, a society like the Dogon, who are not uh, into the idea of a written language, but more of a total understanding of, of reality, would be a great society to try to teach these, um, these terms and these things to, because they would remember them more than right. a society. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense now. Now, also, the structure, okay, the, what they don't describe is a civilizing plan for humanity where the structures of that society were intimately tagged to the symbolic cosmology. And what that means is that every structure and every action of dated life in Dogen society is formulated in a way to reinforce the scientific knowledge. When they weave a cloth, they're doing it by a process that recreates a cosmological process of creation. When they plow a field, they're using a process that's cosmological. When they speak a word, they're uttering symbols that have cosmological meaning and symbolic meaning. Every single aspect of Dogen society helps to reinforce that knowledge, which is why it holds together so coherently down, down through the ages. My book, Primal Wisdom of the Ancients, is discussing all the really interesting ways in which that was accomplished, the kinds of metaphors that were being used that were, that were expected to have coherency for long periods of time, the way um, meaning was assigned to symbols, the way that um, the reason behind certain practices and how those practices help reinforce the same set of knowledge. And every time we encounter one of those, as I've said, we're revealing the hand of this group of teachers. We're, we're, we're um, revealing to ourselves some other aspect of how that group of teachers thought, what their thought process was, what their intention was, what their capabilities were, and so on. There's an awful lot there to be discussed. And it's sort of peripheral to the other books I've written because... I would notice them as I went along, but I but I never had the opportunity to actually sit back and, and recap. Okay, by the way, guys, there are really good reasons to understand that there was an extremely capable group of someone teaching humanity in ancient times, just as every virtually every ancient society claims. Yes, and indeed, that makes now sense to me that, uh, for instance, you mentioned that the Dogon... Uh, had this system where anybody who would want to learn can learn these things if they have the stick to and the interest. Uh, but the rest of the, their society who might not have had uh, the inclination to become a Dogon priest or whatever, they're all still learning the process through these symbols and these systems that are set up for the whole society itself. It's like a sy systemic teaching as well. Right. And there was a whole class of fireside myths that were basically storylines that were designed to introduce the tribe in general in a public way to sort of frame certain symbols, symbolic concepts in a particular way, or to frame a certain mindset of how to think about these concepts. 
had to try to entice um, the young people to want to learn about the tradition. And so essentially the esoteric tradition ends up becoming a kind of a, an ongoing job interview whose purpose is to selectively filter out a group of sincere caretakers for non-materiality. Yeah. If, do you have any uh, idea of what the Dogon might have thought about the concept of reincarnating on multiple lifetimes? Was that discussed? Yes. The, okay. What we know about the Dogon, it comes out of um, anthropo an anthropological study that was conducted by the leading anthropologists of Europe in the day. It started in the 1930s and it continued for three decades. Every year, they, this this gentleman, Marcel Griol, would bring teams into Dogon country to uh, pursue these concepts. Eventually, Griol himself was initiated in the tradition. He was granted Dogon citizenship, and when he died, he was given a Dogon burial. 100,000 Dogon tribe people turned up at his funeral. Wow. Um, they, the Dogon say... According to Marcel Griol, the Dogon flatly say that the only aspect of their tradition that relates to reincarnation is process, relates to processes that have to do with the genetic inheritance of traits from person to person through DNA, essentially. That they as a group don't credit the idea of, of reincarnation in the same way that Hinduism does, say. Um, there's no concept that you're trying to escape from a cycle through, um, through ascending uh, esoteric knowledge or, or um, status, whatever. There's no, this is, this is not a, um, how can I say, this is not, there's no, no competitive process here. There's no progressive competitive type of situation that from the Dogen perspective you have one the Dogen do believe that each person chooses to be here that we made a choice not materially to incarnate in material form and the suggestion is that we might have the option once we're no longer in material form to choose that again but that's not part of any kind of an organized system the Dogen lay out I, I was just going to go there. Next was the fact that uh, if indeed they they have the ability to choose to be, you know, material, obviously on this uh, this part of the universe, did did they also have the ability to like go back to be non-material in another expression of their same consciousness, or uh, would that have been a total different entity that uh, went to the other side? Uh, non well, okay. okay, think about it this way. If the essential difference between the two universes is how quickly time happens, how quickly events happen, how quickly time runs, if you think about that continuum from where we're at to where, say, the quantum world is at, that the essential difference between our world and the quantum world, say the world of entanglement, is quickness time. Well, scientists have actually done measurements. They've measured interactions between two entangled electrons and the same interactions between two non-entangled electrons and discovered that the consistent ratio is entanglement happens 10,000 times more quickly than it happens unentangled. The key difference is how quickly time runs. So... If we imagine that's true, that as you follow this continuum down, there may be no essential difference between what occurs in its own context in the quantum world from what happens in our context. That it's quite possible that in a non-material non frame that there is still differentiation of consciousness the way there is here. It's just the time happens so quickly that it looks like unity does. Very, oh, very sharp. I like that. That's very interesting. Um, because indeed, they're, you know, we're, we're finding out that time is not what we think it is, obviously. Right. Now, the next book that I have planned to write, the one that I, I've also already arranged 
certain research, I've done certain research for, I know where the book's going. The focus of it will be on explaining how you get from primordial energy to things like dimensions and the dynamics of energy that we perceive at the lowest levels and then at higher levels. The Dogen mindset is that there's parallelism all the way up the scale, that if there are a handful of dynamics of energy that play out in parallel form all the way up the scale from the quantum world to beyond universes, and that if you simply pay attention to those dynamics in whatever domain you're in, you can make inferences about what has to be true about the domains you can't observe. Mm -hmm. And so this is the, the hermetic concept of as above, so below. Mm -hmm. A large part of the Dogen system is to point us to the points of correlation between those two things. Here's the quantum world structure. It's a correlate to this macrocosmic structure that we can see right in our, our view from the Earth. And they do it with several different sets of structures to illustrate for us that there actually is parallelism in these forms. That if we understand the dynamics of human consciousness between the two hemispheres of a brain, we already understand the dynamics of, of energetic consciousness between two universes. Their role is very much the same as two hemispheres of a brain. In fact, there is a perspective from which the dynamic between the universes, this yuga cycle, represents a sleep cycle. Um, not a human sleep cycle, but the sleep cycle of a dolphin. A dolphin ha experiences something called unihemispheric sleep. It's why a dolphin doesn't drown when it sleeps. Half the brain goes to sleep at a time, while the other half stays awake and controls the dolphin. And then they switch places, the other half sleeps. That's essentially what's happening with the two universes is, and this locked in state I was talking about that the, the non-material side experiences is a correlate to REM sleep in a human being. It's the, the state we're in where our brain is entirely active, but our, our physical actions have been inhibited. We can't move, but we have consciousness. Um, you know, I have uh, sleep apnea myself, uh, and I sleep with a CPAP machine. I, I've been through, you know, many sleep studies, uh, so I know exactly what you're talking about with the REM sleep and how important that is. Um, matter of fact, my my mother went to high school with uh, this gentleman by the name of Dr. Um, William Dement, who was the guy who invented sleep studies, basically. Uh, so I was, I've was i literally been a pioneer in this field for over 30 years with a CPAP machine. Um, and that makes a whole lot of sense to me. People have no idea uh, how important that REM sleep is to our well-being. Yes. If you deprive a person of that, all sorts of things go wacky. Which is weird because, you know, you don't need a lot of REM sleep in reality that's the rapid eye movement it's what rem stands for but it's just right. an indication of the deep sleep uh, i don't know if it's alpha beta gamma delta whatever the the sleep um uh schedule is but um you don't need a whole lot of it but if you don't get it you're you're in big trouble well my my emerging perspective on all this is okay you know that a dolphin is really a mammal that it spends most of its time underwater, but every so often it still has to poke its head up and take a breath of air to be before it goes back down under the water again. If it didn't do that, it would die. Well, my perspective is that human consciousness is the same way, that periodically, every, every 24 hours, we've got to take a, a breath of non-materiality, which is what sleep is, in order to then continue to, to live materially. Oh, Laird, that is a genius theory. I love that. Oh, my word. And that would explain, I mean, you know, they, they've always wondered, what is sleep for to begin with? Um, right. They, they never really figured that out. But you have hit the nail on the head, I think. That's fantastic. And that's why sleep, there, we all understand that there's a domain of sleep that connects to a level of consciousness that we don't have access to when we're awake. 
we also, uh, I understand, okay, let, let me give you another little explanation here. There's a di dynamic across the boundary between non-materiality and materiality that's described anxious, anciently as unity to multiplicity. The best example I can give you of that is white light producing a rainbow color, the seven rainbow colors of light as it passes through a crystal. Anything that displays itself with that dynamic, from my point of view, crosses that boundary of non-materiality to materiality. Um, another uh, familiar example is a single tone that can be represented, come to be represented as seven notes of a musical scale. Yeah, yeah. Very good. With different vibrations. Okay, now, ancient, the ancient uh, cosmological words that I work with don't carry a single meaning, they carry a cluster of meanings. Um, and those clustered meanings hold true across the boundaries of different cultures and even of different languages. The clusters don't float with the phonetics, they float with the concept. Oh and uh, the, clusters, the clusters involve um, meanings that are discrete, that you can't reasonably guess the secondary meanings in the cluster if you, by knowing one of them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this, this clustering of elements is, is key to the whole, the whole process that, that, that's going on here. Well, it turns out that sleep images, the, if a person can tell me, describe to me, the key scenes and key actions and key feelings, key words and so forth, that appear to them in a particularly vivid dream, those play out in terms of those same clusters. I can go to an Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary and discover and demonstrate that that whole cluster of set of things are represented by a single phonetic value in the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Dictionary, and usually there's uh, an additional meaning that that ends up sorting itself out as sort of the the core message of that dream. Oh my! You uh, you and okay, you, you you mentioned the fact that the synchronicities of your friend's dream was so impactful to you, and now I understand why. Right now, UFO contacts, the UFO cases that are reported to people like John Mack and Bud Hopkins, play out in terms of those same clusters of meanings that I can also use an Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary to associate all, all those, you know, when the, uh, the witness says the UFO moved upward and I had felt a certain feeling or moved away and it changed to a particular color or that... Um, all, all sorts of events that happen with the, in those UFO counties. I'll give you another uh, better example. A woman steps out on her porch and sees three gray aliens who don't know she's there at first. But when they realize she's there and they turn to move away, she doesn't see three gray aliens move away. She sees three deer move away. Right. The ancient Egyptian word that means to depart in haste is also the same phonetics as the word that means deer. Oh my goodness. <laughs> In other words, there's kind of a telepathy between what the, the alien being is, the actions they're taking or the things they're feeling or the things they're trying to accomplish and what the observer observes or what they strongly feel or what, uh, how they relate the, the um, experience. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, and they play out terms of these same clusters. That's that's pure Jungian, Jungian right there. That's fascinating. Oh, my word. Laird Scranton, this has been a fascinating three hours, uh, literally. On, and I can't believe that it. it's gone by this quickly, but uh, I have learned so much just by listening to you. And I want people to know how to get your info. How, how would they find your information just real quickly? Well, you can find my books um, at any bookstore. I mean, you can order them through any bookstore. They're available on Amazon and so forth. Or you can go to, I have author pages at SimonandSchuster.com, where all my books are listed, and at InnerTraditions.com. Uh, as far as me personally, the best place to find me is on Facebook. 
I joke that you shouldn't confuse me with all the other Laird Scrantons out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not that many of them, so fantastic. <laughs> oh, Laird, thank you very much. This has been a real pleasure for me. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me on. It's always a pleasure to talk about these subjects with people who have their own perspectives and their own experiences and their own body of knowledge to draw from. Well, we're going to have to ask you to come back again Ed, for some more historic, you know, uh, discussions. But thank you again. You have yourself a wonderful week. Okay, thank you very much. All right now. Thank you. everyone that Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. You can find out more information at bumblefoot.com. A very special thanks to everyone listening in at home, in your cars, at work, and in the chat rooms, wherever you are around the world. Remember, the show is currently copyrighted by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thanks for sharing your evening with us, folks, because to, together, my friends, we own the night. Good night, everyone. We'll see you next Sunday on Spaced Out Sunday.